So he says to you tonight, don't be afraid. Trust me, look to me. I've been with you in the past. I'm still with you now. And I will be with you, with you again. The psalmist prayed these words. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. Father God, help each one of us, we pray, to echo those words, that we might not be fearful, but that we might trust in you day by day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do please sit down. I want to take you back to 1538. The reformer John Calvin had left Geneva and settled in Strasbourg. And three years later, he returned to Geneva and remained there for the rest of his life. In his first sermon on his return, he carried on from where he had left off three years before, dismissing his absence as a mere interruption in his preaching. Nine months ago, I preached on 2 Samuel 8, and now I continue on chapter 9. <laughs> so perhaps I can echo Calvin's words, as I was saying to you before, not that you'll remember. Tonight we're beginning a new sermon series on 2 Samuel. You might find it useful to have page 260 open in the Pew Bibles. And I want us together to look at chapter 9, under three simple headings. The background and circumstances, the kindness of God, the kindness of David, and the kindness of God. First then, the background and circumstances. In the Old Testament, we have a series of narrative histories. One and two Samuel, one and two Kings, followed by a summary of the Old Testament, which we call 1 and 2 Chronicles. These histories have a theological purpose, to set before us how it was that the God who spoke is the God who acts, the God who acts in human history. Not simply as a detached observer, but as an active participant. Remember that the God who speaks is the God who acts. The two books of Samuel include his own birth, ministry, and death, and cover the reigns of two kings, Saul and his son-in-law David. Samuel was the kingmaker who had anointed both men to lead the nation. And if you find dates helpful, as I do, we're talking about the period something like a thousand years before Christ. In 1 and 2 Kings, the story continues with the death of King David and the reign of his son Solomon. And though David established Jerusalem as his capital and built his palace there, he was not permitted to build the temple. That task was given to Solomon. After the death of Solomon, the nation was divided, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And one and two kings takes up the story from consolidation to division from freedom to exile, from independence to slavery in Babylon. That really, in essence, is a summary of 500 years of biblical history. It gives us the context for 2 Samuel. We are therefore in the transition period from Saul to David, from regular battles to relative peace, from a growing sense of national identity that would culminate in securing Jerusalem as a capital city, the home of the king and the symbolic presence of the Lord in the temple. King Saul and his fit and able sons had died in battle. Saul's surviving son, Ishbosheth, succeeded him and reigned for two years. And so the conflict continued between the house of Saul and the house of David. 
Then Ishbosheth was assassinated and his severed head was presented to David. And so it was that David became the king, first in Hebron and then in Jerusalem. He was 30 when he became king and he died when he was 70. And while there was relative peace within the nation, David still had enemies to fight. In the south were the Moabites, and to the west were the Philistines, and we read about those in chapter 8. To the east were the Ammonites, we read about them in chapter 10. And between these two warring factions, we have the touching interlude in chapter 9, the moving story of David and Mephibosheth. Now, we may not be politicians or leaders of armies, but all of us form part of a network of relationships within our own families, our neighbours, our colleagues at work, and with fellow members of the church here. So how does our faith play out in those very different contexts? As Christians, we are committed to Christ, and as we live the Christian life and face the challenges of obedience and witness, we live out that life in an imperfect world, alongside believers and unbelievers. How then do we show God's love to our neighbour? How do we radiate the character of Christ to those around us? How evident is it to them that our life is set apart? 2 Samuel chapter 9 gives us some clues, principles and good practice. So then first, the background and circumstances, and second, the kindness of David. I wonder what prompted David to ask the question in verse 1. Is there anyone left in the, of the house of Saul? Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul? And being what it is, human nature would surely add, whom I could kill, so that my position will be secure and I will have no rivals. That's what we would have expected David to have said. At the time, that would have been the custom. To kill off members of the previous regime. To secure your own position. To cover your back. But remarkably, David doesn't say that. Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And notice that he repeats himself here in verses 1 and 7. And in Scripture, when they repeat themselves, it is important we take notice of these things. Saul's son David, Saul's son Jonathan, was David's close friend and companion, whom he loved as a brother. And their relationship was, in some sense, a covenant between them. But was it simply covenant love that bound them together? Was it simply his own human kindness? Or was it, in effect, an expression of God's kindness? Hopefully it was both, since David could demonstrate God's kindness through his own actions. God's covenant love could be shown to someone who was needy and fearful and afraid. David could have destroyed this potential rival to his throne. Instead, he provided for him. He gave him a home, no longer poor but rich. The one to whom David showed the love of God was Mephibosheth, the grandson of King Saul, the son of Jonathan. So here was this potential rival to David, one who, could, uh, who, who through descent could claim the throne and who could endanger his life. But he was physically disabled and was no real threat to David. For it says in verse 13, he was lame in both feet. He was not a threat, but one who needed compassion and support. And it was through his action that David demonstrated the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God. Earlier in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, we are told how it was that Mephibosheth became disabled. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old, 
when the news about the death of Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled, and as she fled, in her haste, she fell, and he became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. What a tragedy. He suffered from a severe disability from childhood. He was cut off from other people and no doubt extremely frustrated. Surely we are moved by his condition. Mephibosheth had not been born lame, but had been carelessly dropped by a nurse. Of course, we know what had happened to the boy, but what happened to the nurse? What happened to her? If she had lived, she would have carried the guilt with her for the rest of her life. It was one of those situations which we often find ourselves in, isn't it? What if I had done this or that and it would never have happened? I wonder, is there something that you have to live with? Perhaps a hurt or anxiety or situation that weighs on your mind, that numbs your conscience and always brings you down. And perhaps again, celebrate recovery might be able to help you and support you and help to turn your life round again. David was both kind and generous. The land that King Saul had owned was to be farmed and to provide income to support Mephibosheth. He would no longer live in isolation, but he was invited to eat at the king's table. No longer cut off from the royal court, he was reinstated and given accommodation in Jerusalem to be near to the royal court. David was a strange mixture, wasn't he? A man of God who had feet of clay. He was, like you and me, both a saint and a sinner. He knew that he was not as he should be. Like us, he was fallible and weak, a mass of contradictions. Sometimes alone and afraid and vulnerable. Sometimes far from God and needing to be forgiven. Sometimes close to him and able to express praise and thanksgiving and worship. You and me and David have so much in common. David could have been less than generous to this potential rival. It would have been easy for him to have had him killed, but in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we see David as a warm, generous, caring person. One who had himself experienced the love of God and the mercy of God. And now, in turn, he showed it to one who was deeply deserving. Don't you see yourself in the character of David? Sometimes close to God, and at other times far from him. Sometimes cold and indifferent to the one who has loved you and saved you. Often indifferent to the needs of those around you, being proud of your humility, concerned more with self than with the Lord and with other people. John Newton referred to himself as Mr. Self, as the one who was full of spiritual pride, of self-righteousness, of self-importance, and of self-centeredness. One who was preoccupied with himself. And Newton's counsel was this, pray earnestly for a deep sense of your own insufficiency. Pray earnestly for a deep sense of your own insufficiency. And of course the good news is that God takes weak, feeble creatures like you and me and steadily transforms us by his Holy Spirit to become more and more like Jesus. If we are Christians, we have been saved, we are being saved, and at the last we shall be saved. Gradually, Mr. Self is being changed to become more and more like Jesus. And that, of course, has profound uh, implications for us in terms of how we live our lives and how we serve other people. The background and circumstances, and second, the kindness of David, and third, the kindness of God. I could, of course, finish there, but the narrative 
includes two clear encouragements for each of us as we begin this new year. Did you notice those three words in verse 7? They've occurred, indeed, throughout the service tonight. Don't be afraid. Mephibosheth could well have been trembling and fearful as he came into David's presence. We read that he fell on his face and paid homage to him. Depending on the severity of his disability, this might well have been very painful to him. And to those nearby, rather comic to see him trying to prostrate himself before the king. And David said quite simply to him, Mephibosheth, don't be afraid. I will show you kindness for the sake of your father and restore the land of your inheritance and provide for you. Further back in the Old Testament, following the death of Jacob, Joseph said to his brothers, do not be afraid. Like Mephibosheth, they too bowed down. They feared that Joseph would kill them. But instead he said to them, don't be afraid, for am I in the place of God? During the storm on the Sea of Galilee, the disciples were scared, scared of the storm, and storms on the lake can come up very quickly without any warning. Scared of the storm and scared when they saw Jesus walking on the water. And what did he say to them? Don't be afraid. And as he climbed into the boat, the storm abated. His presence brought them his peace. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I don't know about your own particular circumstances, something within your family, something in your own life, something at work. You may be fearful of the future for your children or a family member or a work colleague or a possible redundancy. For these reasons, 2016 is not going to be an easy year. Remember, of course, that God may well be testing you and challenging you in ways that will be unsettling, <coughs> confronting you to make a choice, nudging you to move on. And so he says to you tonight, don't be afraid. Trust me. Look to me. I've been with you in the past. I'm still with you now. And I will be with you, with you again. Don't be afraid. And the second thing to notice is in verse 3. <coughs> On the face of it, the story of Mephibosheth was about King David's kindness to a potential rival to the throne. He needn't have acted, of course, as he did. He didn't have to be gracious towards him. It would have been far easier for him to have had him killed. But instead, what did he do? He showed him kindness. But we need to be thinking and asking ourselves, was it just his kindness? David certainly showed him human kindness, but at a far deeper level we discover something here about divine kindness, of the generosity of God, of the grace, love and mercy of God towards you and me. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. We can't accrue any merit. None of us are the worthy recipients of God's generosity. We sin so frequently and so readily. We fall so far short of what God expects of us. We don't deserve God's love. We don't deserve his mercy. We're not worthy to receive his grace. But yet, but yet, he loves you and me. He wants to express his generosity to those who don't merit it or deserve it. God's love is to the loveless. God's love is to the sinner. God's love is to the undeserving. God's love is for you and for me. At the beginning of this new year, is there something, is this something that you need to hear? For some, for the first time perhaps to be reminded of for others. In this past year, living the Christian life has been hard. And you've fallen so many times. You've gone your own way, and you've turned away from the Lord. 
Mr. Self has dominated your life and Christ has been pushed into second place. Or if you're honest, no longer has any place at all because your heart has grown cold. Your love for the Lord has almost gone. Religion has taken the place of faith. Pride has overwhelmed you. Sin is more attractive than the Saviour. If that is you at the beginning of this new year, then resolve tonight to look to the Lord. Commit your life afresh to him. Don't be afraid. Come to Christ, trust him, obey his word, and like Joseph's brothers and Mephibosheth, as you bow down before the Lord in humility and obedience, he will raise you up. He will restore you. He will comfort you. He will be alongside you. Permit him to be first in your life. So trust him. Believe in him. Have faith in him. Commit yourself afresh to him. And in the year ahead, walk by faith, not by sight. Day by day, look to Jesus. Let's just be quiet for a few moments. Father God, you know each one of us very intimately. And as we come before you, we ask that you would look mercifully upon us, to forgive us, to cleanse us, and to make us more like Jesus. And if we are fearful, remove our fear and help us to trust in you and love you day by day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.